major victory just happened for the Trump campaign. And actually not with Trump in general and what he said. Not something he's done even this last year, but something that happened in his first term years ago. What am I talking about? The legacy that a president does is really more about who he appoints, who he nominates, and who he puts forth as a Supreme Court Justice. Well, this week, three big cases that came down that brings great victories for the conservative side, for people who want to see freedom, but also want to see normalcy back to America. Well, today we're going to talk about that and, and again, show on a proven leader and how important it was for him to get these Supreme Court picks and how important it is to see what they just decided. All these impact you. Let's dive in. Welcome to the Max. Thank you so very much for being here today. Remember, this is the end of the month, or actually the first of the month. So, uh, this is your last day, July 1st, to get into all the drawing for June. All it takes is you subscribing, commenting below, give us a thumbs up. You will be entered into the giveaway. Uh, we have hundreds of dollars worth of stuff away here and on X. So, make sure that you are following us here and on X and make sure that you are subscribed. Our goal is to grow together for us to get a common sense knowledge and wisdom as we try to navigate this crazy world. And that's kind of what the whole point of the video is today, what true leadership looks like. Even if you don't like Trump, these, point, these appointments and these people that were put on the, the Supreme Court made some huge impacts for anyone who loves liberty, freedom, and normalcy back to America. Now let's jump into these and we'll talk about them and how they actually impact you. All right, the first one we're going to talk about is the Chevron deference. Now, this is something that happened in 1984. What it basically did was give a power to agencies in the administrative state, the bureaucracy of Washington, not your elected officials. So all these things were set to where if this agency was over water, this agency was over uh, environment, this agency was over petroleum, what it did is it said that they were going to be the experts to set policy, to set regulations, and to set precedent. Now what that means is, say for instance, they didn't like you fishing this certain kind of fish, then you couldn't fish it anymore. Now legally, that was not the law of the land, it was just what this agency said. If all of a sudden they passed down this new tax that you had to pay, it's not the fact that your representative did that or Congress did that, it was the fact that this agency had power to do those things. So therefore, it just got overturned. We're going to talk about how it got overturned and what the impact of it was. Now. In this case, and Spike Cohen did a great job of talking about it on X, but it says the situation and how it came to be. Um, we have got it overturned, again, six for the overturning, which is the conservatives versus three uh, that was still wanting this uh, overregulation to keep on happening. But it was basically saying a family fisherman, there was a family fishing company, an enterprise that was driven out of business. They, were, they could not actually do business anymore because the National Marine Fisheries Service, which is one of these wonderful agencies that our government sets up, was charging them $700 a day to monitor their company. Now, right or wrong, whatever they may be doing, this was not a policy and law that was set. It was by this agency using this law, using this Chevron deference and this court case to set policy to say, you know what, we're bureaucracy, we know what's best, you've got to pay this fine. It was basically taxation on this company. Well, they shut the company down. There was no federal law stating that this organization, this agency, could charge this money to this company. So that's how this got overturned, basically, because people said, wait, this is not law. How are they setting law when there's not any law on the books passed for them to, to basically tax this fishing company? Now. How does this impact you? Why is Democrats going crazy over this and Republicans are applauding the situation? Listen how it impacts the bureaucracies around the country. The OHSA that decided to make sure that you can get this in your arm made big companies do that. If it was over a certain amount of employees, they had to get it. The agency that did that used this law here to say, you know what, well, we're the experts, so you have to get that. Also. The ATF, you know, the, the situation where um, uh, automatic versus semi-automatic, the terminology, the way that they can take some of your rights away with 2A, that's, they use this law for that. The NCRS that sets uh, who you can put, how you can put a pond in your property, or if you can take this little nasty mosquito pond out or clear this land and make it better, what if they classify as a wetland? What if they say there's some endangered animal there and you can't touch it? That's the law they use. So these experts actually were not experts. They were just agencies with too much power and the bureaucracy. 
So guess what? The overturning allows for a lot of these things to go away. Allows for people to be able to have less regulation on them as they go about their life and do their jobs. It's amazing that the, we have so many government agencies that should be taken out or deregulated. And this is a good first step. So this is a huge win for conservatives, huge win for libertarians, and anyone who wants freedom. Number two, this is one I think it's just a better law and order practice. Even for us in, in freedom-oriented thought pattern, I mean, I'm a conservative. However, there is true um, regulation law that are good, meaning we want to be safe. We want our family safe. Well, let's talk about cities. Cities are falling to pieces. They're falling to pieces and they're dangerous. Well, they passed on another decision that allows for criminalization and for making sure these tent cities, these homeless encampments are gone out of the cities. Now, people say, oh, well, that's, that's, that's too much. No, listen, I, I, love, I used to love New Orleans when I was a kid. We used to go and when we were teenagers and we're about three hours away, we're not far. And because uh, we're in Mississippi, we cross right over and we're not far from uh, New Orleans. So three or four hours we're there. It used to be the coolest place. Me and Misty would go get some beignets at Cafe Du Monde. We'd go to the Riverwalk, go to the malls, just beautiful locations. Uh, we even did some missions down there and tried to, to, to minister to people and help them out, even the homelessness uh, situation. Most people in the home, homelessness situation that we have dealt with, pretty much some of them were down on their luck, but some of them were just in calls because of the situations they've put themselves in, maybe with drugs or with alcohol or with other life choices. Here's the thing. When we went down there, they would say, you know, when you, we were in the French quarters or we were in Jackson Square or we were at restaurants, you know, at five or six, you'd kind of move out of certain areas because they knew there was a lot more homelessness and a lot more people come in there and that's where they sleep at night. Well, they'd try to run a little bit out, but pretty much cities were liberalized. They just let them stay there. Well, now what this case does is it allows for people to not be able to do that anymore if the cities enforce it. Now, I don't trust the cities too much, but as the pendulum is starting to swing, where you're starting to see more cities say, I'm tired of all this, this, this encampments, these, these migrant encampments, these homelessness encampments, what's going to happen is this allows them to get them off the streets. Back to New Orleans. Uh, there's a guy I know that drives down there and works down there. He actually told me just a few days ago, he said, you can't go anywhere in the city hardly without having encampments and people begging you for money or begging you for food. He said it's not the fact that they're bad people, it's just they've been put in predicaments to where now they'll do anything for food or money. And therefore, he said there's a lot of problems with theft, there's a lot of problems with people stealing, there's a lot of problems with them pandering and begging. So, so what happens is we've allowed this to happen in our cities and we've allowed them to pretty much take over our cities where now they're so crime-ridden, you're not safe going down any streets because are you worried about this person uh, jumping you? Are you worried about this person thieving you? Are you worried about this person asking for money? What kind of scenario are you put you and your family in? So if we see cities start to say, you know what, I'm not going to allow y'all just to put thousands of tents here, it allows it to be criminally prosecuted. Now, the reason I find value in this, because I have to pay property tax to own this property. I have to have all these taxes, all these things paid each and every month to make sure that I get to live here. However, the homelessness can live on the street that our taxes pay for, for free, and just to set up and just defecate on the street, urinate on the street, cause problems, I mean trash, nastiness. So am I, am I wanting to help those people? Absolutely. But helping them is not live, letting them live on the street. Helping them is trying to find ways to minister to them and get them some help that they're needing. So I think this is a good first step in saying, you know what, we don't want overregulation, but at the same time, we can't live on the streets anymore. This is not a third world country. We need to help these individuals, help them when we can, but at the same time, they can't live on the streets. It's not right. So I think this is a great policy. I don't think many cities are going to embrace it yet because a lot of them are ran by liberal areas. But I think the more people get fed up, I think this could be huge when it comes to making sure our cities and our towns and our streets are safe for our family. Would you allow your kids to walk just at a big homeless encampment or migrant encampment because they can have it because the city allows them to and they can't criminally prosecute them? I wouldn't allow my kids to do that. I think we're trying to get our city safer and I think this is a good policy. Thirdly, which is probably the biggest, there was another decision passed down and Jonathan Turley said this is going to make it where all those people they busted on J6 and got them for treason and insurrection is going to be basically passed down just as trespassing. And he said for most of them, they may be getting out. Commuted sentence, pardon sentence, and overturned to where the, 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 what they tried to hold them on and tried to prosecute them on and try to take their livelihoods away for holding a flag at the Capitol 
now they get to go home or get a lighter sentence. This is huge. And the, the, the reason I think this is probably one of the biggest benefits is because Trump said he was going to pardon him. You know, he's kind of went back and forth, and, and he was the one that got blamed for it all. But now the new story out with Nancy Pelosi taking, uh, you know, the blame saying that she should have put the, the, the National Guard there. Also Trump saying that he was willing to send them. Also Trump, new reports come out showing that what he put on Twitter, hey, peaceful. I think all this benefits him because now he's not having to be the one to step into it. The Supreme Court is saying, whoa, whoa, way too much. This was a major DOJ problem here, and we need to overturn this. So a lot of the people that were being held in jails and prison is now going to be lightened sentence or let go. This is a huge, huge win for conservatives and freedom-minded oriented people. Not only that, it's for anyone who just says, I want to hear... I want it also benefits anyone who just wants their voice heard in a way that's true protest like the First Amendment right says. If we have a disgruntlement or a disagreement with our leadership, there's nothing wrong with the protest. The problem is some people took it to riots and things like that. We don't condone that by any means. We're not going to burn down any buildings. But what I'm trying to say is when all of a sudden, because they were the opposition party, that they got hit hard and put in jail, the Supreme Court came down now and said, it's too much. This is not right. We're going to overturn this and lighten the Senate. So that is huge. And it did not take Trump actually saying something. It was because of the legacy he passed down. Now, the whole point of the video is this. This is what true leadership looks like. You don't have to like Trump to say as a conservative and someone like a libertarian or someone who likes freedom that these are good policies all because of something he did in 2016 to 2020 when he got kicked back for putting some of these conservative justices on the bench. Now here's another thing. He could have appointed people like Roberts who kind of played both sides, but he didn't. He, he gave people like Gorsuch that, that is pretty staunch. Now Barrett went against him on this uh, the J6 uh, decision. I didn't like that. So I wish they could even get more conservative. But here's the thing. Obama did this too. Even if you didn't like Obama, he fought for his calls and he put two liberal judges, extremely liberal judges, on justices on the Supreme Court. So now, why, why is this a big deal? Because the legacy of a presidency, it, more than anything, is Supreme Court decisions, Supreme Court justices, and things that he does across the world. Well, Trump has proven himself across the world. We had no wars. Now he's proven himself with the Supreme Court justice picks. Pretty huge. And here's the thing. Two of the best justices that the conservative side has is Alito and Thomas. Both of those guys are not getting younger. So whoever is the president in the next four years could likely appoint one or two justices to the Supreme Court. And you're talking about two conservative, awesome winners when it comes to the way we look at things. So therefore, if Trump is in, he's got a chance to appoint two more younger, staunch conservatives that could fill that gap. Think about if all of a sudden Trump didn't win 2016 to 2020, it was Hillary. What would have happened? What would have happened? None of the things like Roe, none of this stuff with the homeless encampment, none of the situations that's been passed down, the overregulation that took place, that's still taking place, all that would have kept on going if a Democrat would have won. So this is what true leadership looks like. This is where we have to have someone who wants to see deregulation, a better economy, and wants to have some normalcy back to America. Normal laws that keep us safe, but at the same time not overregulating us as Americans. That's what's really on the ballot for 2024, is the legacy of leadership. Can we appoint two more good justices if all of a sudden our two go out? Now, Alito and Thomas are awesome. I hope they don't. But remember, we, get, we don't get younger. So if they all of a sudden go out, I would rather have someone who is on the Republican side or on the right who can appoint two more conservatives. And this could be a win. Now, all three of these decisions, you can read more about them. Basically, you have deregulation with the first one. You have good law to say, you know what? We don't need encampments in our cities. We need to keep them safe. And then thirdly, realizing that this was a trespassing charge, realizing there were some crazy things on J6, but most of it was actually not as bad as they say, and some of these people can at least go home to their families. That is huge. Guys, give me your thoughts on this, and that's why I think this is going to be a, a very important election, because whoever wins could be appointing more justice on the smaller courts, middle courts, but even the Supreme Court, and we see the value of Supreme Court justices. Also remember, 
to subscribe to the channel. That way you could be entered in the giveaway. We'll be drawing that later on this evening and releasing it tomorrow. I can't wait to show you some of the gifts that you'll be getting. Thank you guys for watching. God bless. Thank you.